just do a quick volume? Yeah. Have you ever been checking the sound through this again? Sure that the battery are yeah, it should seems be to be there's no light. No, it's fine. Go back. I just restarted though. We'll try reloading. Yeah, I think that's fine. Okay. Works now? Hmm. Okay. All right. Uh, delighted to have uh, Nicolas uh, Chamel from Belgium uh, telling us about uh, developments in modeling neutron star crust. Well, thanks. Uh, well, actually, I will uh, maybe contrary to the, what the title said, so I will not uh, give an overview of all the developments regarding the modeling of the cross because it would take take me probably the whole day. So I will uh, only uh, focus on, on the work we did, so it will be strongly biased to, towards uh, the work we did, but I will mention some, uh, some other developments uh, as well. So if so uh, why uh, are we interested in, uh, in uh, studying the physics of the crust? Well, we, we've already heard this, uh, this week that the, the crust, uh, even though it's about 1% of the mass of a neutron star and about 10% of the radius, uh, it's uh, believed to play a key role in various phenomena like glitches, uh, obviously bursts, superbursts, deep crustal heating, and, and so on and so forth. Now, uh, the challenge is that uh, also the crust is made only of neutrons, protons, electrons and at rather low density, so below saturation. So you may think, okay, it's, uh, things are easy. Uh, well, actually, uh, we have a, a, a whole variety of, uh, of different phases um, fr from this matter, and the challenge is trying to describe uh, all these different phases uh, in a consistent way um, and, and um, in a way using the, the same nuclear model for describing all these uh, uh, these different phases where at low, very low density uh, you have only nuclei, but at higher density then you have some kind of neutron proton clusters with, with, uh, uh, with a neutron liquid uh, um, permeating them. So uh, the, our goal uh, in Brussels is trying to, to, uh, uh, to describe these phases uh, using the same, uh, same nuclear model. So the outline uh, of my talk uh, is, is shown here, so I will essentially uh, describe uh, uh, the, the nuclear models we have been developing for, for several years, uh, and then I will show some applications about the, the, the equation of state and the, the composition of, of neutron star crust, uh, also about uh, superfluidity and uh, not only pairing gas but also the dynamics of this superfluid. And uh, if I have time, also to say a few words about uh, collective excita excitations. So let me first start with uh, effective nuclear models. So why effective? Because if you want to make a brute force calculation with very realistic uh, interaction, this is at present uh, not feasible. So uh, we have to rely on, on some uh, more uh, phenological approach, uh, some effective approach. And uh, the idea is to use the, the density functional theory, which has been uh, probably very uh, successfully applied in various fields, 
uh, in condensed matter and chemistry uh, and in physics has been also very successful. So uh, just in, in, in two equations trying to explain what, what, what it is. So uh, basically you assume that the energy of your system, either a finite nuclei or uh, a lump of your crust, is, is some kind of uh, uh, the, the integral of some, uh, of some functional. So for simplicity we use this just a semi-local functional, but you can think about something more complicated which is non-local, so it's, uh, uh, but okay, let's make life simpler. Uh, and essentially all of these densities uh, depends on some single particle wave functions and these wave functions themselves are solutions of, of this kind of equation. So this is a closed system and so uh, the idea is to solve this system uh, of equations self-consistently and uh, at the end you get uh, the energy of, uh, of your system. Uh, so, so this idea can be extended also to account for superfluidity uh, uh, but okay, I, I will just, the idea is essentially the same. The equations are changed, but the idea is, is the same. And everything is fine, uh, except that, uh, well, the key quantity here is this function, which we don't know. So, um, so, so the main problem is trying to find uh, some uh, approximate form for this, uh, for this uh, functional. Now at this point I would like to, uh, to emphasize the distinction between different kind of parameters or variables if you want. So there are parameters which are related to the, to the condition uh, prevailing in the star, so like the temperature, the pressure, the magnetic field. So these are given by uh, the physical conditions. And there are also, uh, let's say, some nuclear parameters uh, that we have uh, already heard a lot during this week. Uh, which characterizes uh, the properties of homogeneous uh, infinite nuclear matter. Uh, and mainly, in general, these coefficients are introduced at t equals to zero. So there is a symmetry energy when one expands the energy per nucleon as a function of, uh, of, uh, dense of, as a function of uh, isospin asymmetry. And uh, this quantity itself, the symmetry energy, can be exp expanded uh, at a function of density, and one introduces these coefficients j symmetry energy at saturation and L and one can, I mean, goes on on the expansion and introduce more coefficients. So in principle, these various coefficients can be uh, constrained by experiments, but also they can be um, estimated from uh, uh, ab initio calculations like uh, Stefano uh, showed, um, um, quantum Monte Carlo calculations or any, many body. Uh, approach in principle one can also calculate these quantities. So this is, uh, um, this is a way of uh, uh, knowing uh, these quantities one can um, constrain, uh, constrain the, the functional we, we shall use. Now uh, on the market there are uh, many uh, hundreds of different functionals uh, the only problem that actually, and, and well, these functionals, uh, some of them are more successful than others to predict the properties, to explain the properties of, uh, of, uh, of nuclei, finite nuclei. Uh, the only problem is that most of these functional, actually they are not suitable for, uh, for neutron stars. And the reasons are given here. So most of them actually they were just fitted to very few nuclei like uh, oxygen, lead, uh, just, so just a few nuclei and with equal numbers of neutrons and protons. So if you want to extrapolate to, uh, uh, to neutron star crust where you have very rich neutron rich nuclei then well it's not a very good idea to use these kinds of functionals. Uh, functional gi giving a realistic neutron matter equation of state uh, there are not so many and likewise also about pairing gaps and uh, effective masses which we have heard uh, also yesterday, we have discussed yesterday. Uh, and there are also problems with, uh, with instabilities, like uh, some functional predicting some ferromagnetic transition. So, so using this functional, then you would predict that th there, there can be neutron stars because it will become ferromagnetic and then it will collapse. Uh, uh, so. so this is the reason why uh, we have been developing, uh, trying to improve uh, functionals. Uh, so proceeding step by step, trying to, to optimize these functionals. And, and for this purpose, we used uh, 
uh, we have used experimental data, but also uh, trying to rely on, um, on many body calculations. So for experimental data, uh, we take uh, all uh, experimental masses. So there are about 2,000 such, uh, such measurements. Uh, charge radii, uh, and we also um, uh, check about the, 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 the symmetry energy. So this is, uh, let's say, uh, the range of values that, uh, that are expected from uh, various uh, experiments, as was reviewed yesterday. Uh, the compressibility. Uh, and for the many body calculations, so, well, obviously, one of the constraints is for pure neutron matter, if you want to use that for, for neutron stars but also pairing gaps uh, that are relevant for, uh, for the crust, uh, effective masses, and also to check about the stability. So what we have done about uh, for, for the past few years uh, is summarized here. So in the, the first functional we, we, uh, we got was to uh, fit uh, realistic pairing gaps. Uh, then we also uh, generalized these functionals to, to remove um, these various uh, ferromagnetic instabilities. Can I ask uh, yes. a couple of details? Uh, mm -hmm. With regard to the pairing gaps, does mm -hmm. that mean you just fit odd-even mass splittings? No, no, no. So, so the pairing gaps calculated in uh, pure neutron matter and symmetric nuclear matter. Oh, I'm sorry. Of course, yes. So uh, and the spurious instabilities, uh, how do you just worry about those up to the saturation density or higher densities as well? Or? Uh, yeah, for higher densities as well, but only in homogeneous matter. So you can still have some finite size instability, which was discovered actually more recently. So afterwards, um, uh, it was found that uh, functionals may still have some finite size instabilities. And correcting for that, at least for, I mean, above saturation, is, uh, is quite challenging. And we are sure. currently working on that. So there are still some instabilities. Not all have been removed, but... Uh, um, at least uh, uh, up to, uh, let's say, twice saturation, it, it's fine for the finite size. Yes, yes, in bulk matter, yeah. yeah. And, uh, how does it so this is what I, so, so you can still have some uh, finite size instabilities yeah, in nuclei but even in bulk or in, in bulk matter, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is an instability with a finite Wavelength? Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. So, so these kind of instabilities are spurious. So, no, 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 no. I mean, the, the, the instabilities I'm referring to are, uh, are completely spurious, and in some cases, this can <coughs> spoil also calculations of finite nuclei. But uh, to find these instabilities in finite nuclei, it's s generally people do, do not find them because they are working on a basis with a limited number of uh, wave functions. So you, I mean, the, the system is too constrained to, uh, to see these instabilities. But it was found quite recently that there, are this, there is this problem. So yes. Yes, so for, um, so well for, for instance, for this, for the re removal of these instabilities and for re fitting also realistic neutral matter equations, the two are related, we had to, um, to generalize the functional, so to add uh, extra terms. Otherwise, it was not, uh, it was not possible. Well, it's possible, but then the neutral matter equation is very soft. And this is, well, depending on the many body calculations you trust, it may or may not be. Is there uh, a simple thermodynamic relationship for the ferromagnetic instability? Uh, how relationship. Do, how do you look for that? Oh. GP by GN. It's, well, it's so just, well, actually, no. Well, actually, we are checking uh, the instability, and not just, well, Lando parameters is one possibility. But Lando parameters tells us only the, the onset of the instability. But you could still have, well, you can imagine some fancy behavior where there is no instability at, uh, let's say, zero spin, but you can still have instability at, fi at finite spin polarization. So we checked at any polarization, not just lambda parameters, but any kind, just comparing the energy of polarized matter with energy of non-polarized matter. So if you have a force with no spin, you'll never see these? Uh, a force with no spin? Yeah, yeah if, well, if there is a functional without spin, then yeah, you, you won't have instability. Yeah. But 
he won't explain many properties of, of nuclei. So. No, I understand, but you won't have to investigate. Yes, 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 that's true. Yeah. If you use the neutron matter equation state as a constraint, does it remove a, some fraction of these instabilities automatically, or do you need to then? No, it's not automatic. Because it depends on the some part of the functional. I mean, we depend on the, I mean on the spin. So neutron matter, it's not polarized. So it yeah. So suppose you had polarized neutron matter calculations, mm -hmm. microscopic calculations. Mm -hmm. Can it help you? Uh, you know, that's an interesting question to address. Yeah. So microscopic calculations can guide these functionals to remove some of these. Yeah, problems. there have been a few calculations. Uh, uh, so uh, and and actually, there is no calculations microscopic calculations predicting instabilities. So this means that if one finds this kind of, I mean, ferromagnetic transition, then it's, it must be spurious, unless for some reason all microscopic calculations are wrong, which, I don't know, <laughs> it's hard to believe, but so. Uh, and also we explored more recently the sensitivity to the symmetry energy coefficients. Um, and the latest one is this kind of optimal fit using just a standard functional uh, but then this gives a very soft symmetry, uh, a very soft neutron matter equation of state. So it's still uh, in, in the range that is expected from, uh, from let's say, effective field theories. But well, it's uh, it's very soft, so you can't have two solar mass if uh, if, if it's soft until uh, until the highest densities. <coughs> so, um, so as I said, uh, so here's just an example of, of, of three such uh, functionals. So essentially spanning the different range of stiffness for the neutron matter equation of state. So this was, this was the, the, the range of values that, well, that was discussed by, uh, by Stefano. <coughs> and uh, well, actually many recent uh, calculations give essentially the same range of, of, uh, um, uh, of stiffness. <coughs> so we, we just uh, took uh, three different, let's say, representative equations of state. So from the softest, which is uh, the, this old uh, friedman ponipande calculations, and uh, uh, to the stiffest one, uh, which is the Bruckner R24 calculations uh, with three body forces included uh, consistently. Uh, and so the, this, let's say, this is a range of uncertainties uh, regarding the equation of state. Uh, it's, it's the same picture, but just for, the, for this more recent uh, parametrization. So it's essentially the same. Uh, now, how about uh, symmetric nuclear matter? So uh, we did not enforce any constraint on symmetric nuclear matter. So we just checked that it was uh, at least consistent with the, 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 the constraints coming from uh, avion collisions from Danilevich and, and, and from the in this paper. Uh, so how about the symmetry energy? So uh, this picture was uh, already shown yesterday by, uh, by Jim. So uh, this shows uh, the symmetry in the energy equation J as a function of its slope, L, and for different constraints. And uh, here shows where these uh, uh, this, uh, uh, functionals lie. Now for a more, more systematic analysis, and uh, essentially the, the, the range of values we found by fitting uh, nuclear masses lies uh, within this uh, dashed, uh, dashed area. So it's, uh, it's about 30 different uh, mass models. Uh, here is just the, the, the most recent, which I've shown here, but this includes uh, 30 different mass models with uh, root mean square deviation below uh, uh, 0.8. So we only keep uh, the nuclear mass models with, with, this, uh, with this accuracy. And this lies uh, in the range that is consistent with, with other uh, experimental constraints. Um, effective masses, uh, so here are shown the, uh, the effective masses for these three uh, equation of state. And, uh, and uh, unlike uh, uh, some, some uh, function of this kind, uh, there is a right splitting between effective masses. So in neutron rich matter, the neutron effective mass is larger than the proton effective mass. And actually, if you look at the numbers, even the numbers actually are, so this was fixed. This was uh, the result of the fit. And this is actually uh, quite uh, in quite good agreement with uh, many body calculations so from uh, Exonid Bruckner uh, R3 fork calculations. So even the value, not just the splitting is right, but also the values. Sorry, uh, uh, completely outside the field. So yes. one of those numbers, and that's star divided by M. 
So this is a so so you can convert with this so this is so-called isoscalar isovector, but you can convert in a neutron. So if you re replace Q by n neutrons or protons, then with this formula you can obtain the neutron and proton effective masses. So just a way of uh, of fix yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah. Oh, this one. So it was for uh, it was the calculations by the Catania group. So by uh, Umberto Lombardo oh, and uh, uh, no, not uh, Baldo, but I think it was uh, Lombardo's group. So they are both making BHF calculations, but uh, somehow independently. So it was from uh, there. It was a paper from uh, there was Kao, uh, Shuk, Lombardo. I mean. The, uh, the it's extended, yeah, yeah. Extended. yeah, because they are including some <laughs> self-energy <laughs> effects, and yeah, so. So why do we believe those? Well, because this is the, the the calculations that are available. So, and and, and the well, this is one reason, and the other reason is uh, th these values actually are also compatible with what you can infer from uh, giant resonances. So mm -hmm. uh, from iso vector uh, giant dipole resonances, one expect also to have. A, uh, an effective mass that you, the problem is that there are larger error bars, so it's, it's, it's something like between uh, 0 0.7 and 1. So for both of those points. No, for the for the for this one, for this iso vector one. Mm -hmm. So from uh, iso vector giant dipole resonance, then uh, this is around 0 0.7, but there are larger error bars, so uh, it's not very constraining. But is there an experimental test for M? Uh, well, experimental tests are dipole, uh, are giant dipole resonances, but then they are more. Si um, the systematics are large, and it's uh, difficult to pinpoint exactly the value of this of, the, of this effective mass. So, so that's why we relied on on, uh, on these calculations. But I mean, if they are other, then well, but it would be fine to. We are happy. To to, uh, bulk yes, bulk matter. Yes, okay. homogeneous so matter. It's it's the same game as um, as for heavy ion collisions, if you wish. Yeah. That this is, you know, you are constraining uh, the functional. So you make a calculations with your functional in finite nuclei. You compute the um, uh, let's say the the the, the 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 giant resonances and so on, and then you look back at your functional and which effective mass in bulk matter gave you. Uh, yeah, that's very really well. Mm -hmm. They have the opposite trend. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, this one, they pick giant resonances. Now, what mm -hmm. am I to do? So, uh, well, I'm not sure that they fit well all uh, is a vector giant dipole resonances. Do they fit? Uh, yes, that's yeah, this I'm not sure because we, we checked, uh, we, we did actually the calculations. So, we do the, uh, yes, we did the RPA calculations and it was in very good agreement with. Uh, so this is Gianluca Colo who did the calculations, um, uh, these RPA calculations, and we checked that for the resi giant yeah, resonances. That's why I said that people don't listen to me. OK, yeah. Okay. So I mean, one has to look in the details. Uh, I agree that. Uh, but I mean, th this is also why maybe the, the only the giant resonances are not uh, strong any, uh, enough constraining. So that's why we took also these many body calculations to check that. Uh, that there is the right behavior, and uh, and this splitting of effective masses. Yes. Okay. Well, well, this we the, well at least this splitting. I think there is. I mean, it has been predicted by also by Dirac Bruckner calculations. So so it's not just one calculation. It has been, and this is a range of values that that that, that we will find. So it's not just one one calculation. So the chiral Lagrangian studies. Has been also mm. yes. yes, yeah, it's it's a common feature. So so if one doesn't not find the splitting, then there's something which is wrong in, in the functional. Which is the case, yes, for the SLY uh, families, then they, they, they don't have this right splitting. Uh, okay, maybe I can just uh, so it's just a summary for the most recent ones. 
uh, for different value of the symmetry energies and is a result of the mass fit. And uh, you can see that this seems to favor a value of J between 29 and 30 MeV. Also, if you look at the most neutron-rich nuclei, uh, this is what seems to, to come out. OK, so let me now switch to, uh, to the application of this function to, to the crust of neutron stars. So uh, the main assumption is we're assuming that uh, matter is fully catalyzed. So one may question this, this approximation, but this is uh, actually the, the, uh, the assumption we are, we are using. And uh, for the outer crust, then the situation is, is fairly simple within this, the, within this assumption. So we assume that atoms are fully ionized and they are arranged in a body-centered cubic lattice because this, this has the lowest energy. Uh, we assume that there is a pure, pure crystal with the uh, uh, same composition and with just a relativistic Fermi gas. So in this case, the only inputs are nuclear masses. And so we use experimental data when they are available. And when they are not, we are using that, uh, our, um, our uh, theoretical estimate for, for, the, for the masses. So what is interesting is that actually um, using just experimental measurements, we can completely determine the structure of the crust of a canonical neutron star down to about uh, 200 meters. So, uh, and so all these, uh, these nuclei have been uh, completely determined. And actually recently there, there, there have been a, a new measurement for zinc isotope, zinc 82. So this has pushed a, a, bit, uh, a bit lower the, this limit, but so. When you think that, well, what we know uh, well about neutron stars is only about 200 meters on the 10 kilometers. So What's the lifetime of zinc 80? It's not much. <laughs> I'm impressed by the experiment. <laughs> yeah, at least there is some hope to go, to, to go deeper uh, thanks to experiments. But I saw a talk where the, they show the model for the crust based mm -hmm. on a theoretical calculation. Mm -hmm. And then when zinc 80 was measured, it turns out mm -hmm. that nucleus had 10 EV. Mm -hmm nucleon more binding mm -hmm. than the theoretical model, and it shifted it a lot, a, a, quite a large distance. So the mm -hmm. differences in energies between these nuclei are very small. Yeah, very small. Yeah. Negligible differences between mm -hmm. the binding energies shift them around. So yeah, exactly. But, but this, I, this is the current situation right. with uh, existing measurements. Mm -hmm. So, and it's unlikely to change. Uh, uh, I mean, th this has been, this sequence has been uh, set for, I mean, for, for uh, for a while now, so it's 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 fairly robust, I would say. Now, of course, if you go to uh, to higher density, so it's it's <coughs> the density is going in this way, so it's it's a bit misleading. But so, so density is increasing here, so you can see that for different uh, mass models, then you can get different uh, different compositions. So already um, at uh, at the depths higher than 200 meters, then uh, it's about here, so 200 meters. Above, then you have you have already some some uncertainties on the, on the composition. Ask a question of uh, philosophy here. I mean yes. You you are trying to uh, determine in very great detail mm -hmm. the composition of the crust. Mm -hmm. How important it is to infer the structure of neutron stars. I, I, you know, you for the structure, it's irrelevant. But it's important, for instance, for uh, for transport properties, or for breaking strain, or for yeah. uh, conductivities, and so on. So, but if you are just interested in the mass and radius, then I mean, it's it's, no, not that, I mean, it's just negligible. Yes, it it helps the because, for instance, well, here there is no superfluidity yet because it's too low densities. But yeah. uh, if you if you're interested in the superfluidity, well, the the, su the the properties of the superfluid depends also on uh, on the composition and the structure of the crust. So. Well, I mean, this will just be one for um, first, for example, mm -hmm. nuclear burning mass. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 that's true. Yeah. I want to ask, in fact, the opposite question. Uh, neutron star observations can't really tell you any of this. That no, that's not quite true. So you, you can learn something from observations. Uh, for instance, I have in mind the, um, uh, the thermal relaxation in a quasi percent of six-ray transients, where um, uh, the, the thermal relaxation of the crust has been monitored for, for um, or over a period of, of several years. And then depending on, on, on the structure you assume for the crust and for the composition, then you, you may or may not fit the cooling curve. So. Uh, 
So from observation, you can also put constraints on, um, on the structure of, uh, of the crust. So it's not, I mean, it's, uh, both are complementary. You but but for, for doing the comparison, one needs to have also theoretical models. So you need to have theoretical models to, to see the prediction of the models with observations. And you need observations to constrain the model. So it's. Yeah, but I, I was just uh, understuck. Mm-hmm. Looking at oh so detailed mm-hmm. predictions of the composition, mm-hmm. of course, which will help you to um, understand the properties, mm-hmm. maybe the well properties. What, what we can observe are the well properties, right? Mm-hmm. I don't know whether we can tell you some mm-hmm. observations such in such mm-hmm. great detail. Yeah. yeah. So there are, mm-hmm. as, as, uh, as Nicholas mm-hmm. was saying, there are observations that are sensitive to say the thermal conductivity of this material. So if you go from one to another and you see that the thermal conductivity changes appreciably so that it affects your interpretation of the data, then it's meaningful to go to this system. Mm-hmm. So what if the crust freezes out at a temperature of mm-hmm. what? A kilovolt or a few mm-hmm. kilovolts? Yeah, this this is still a uh, uh then there'll be a mixture of Yes, yes. And uh, and and this is well this is a point I I wanted to emphasize uh, a bit later on. Are that you the talk about this? Not freeze out, but just showing that the, the energy landscape. So the energy differences are very small between different configurations. So it's extremely unlikely to have just, uh, let's say, a pure iron uh, layer or a pure uh, zinc layer. So in, in reality, one would expect of uh, quite, uh, uh, quite impure crust with a mixture depending on the history, uh, on the history of the of the star. Yeah. Uh, here it won't change very much because essentially uh, you can see that th- there is some change in the thickness of, of, of these layers, but the composition is more or less the same, and the conductivity depends mainly on, on Z, on the proton fraction. And Z doesn't change even when there is some change in, um, uh, in composition. Generally, the change in Z is not so dramatic, so, uh, so you, you, I, I don't expect to have a dramatic, I mean, uh, change of the thermal conductivity by uh, orders of magnitude it will be rather small, small change. But it c- it can be a significant change if if you think that you have a mixture. Then if if depending on, on, on the distribution of nuclei you have, then it can change a lot the uh, the thermal conductivity. So. Uh, so something we have also uh, played with is about the magnetic field. So like for magnetars, so if you have a strong magnetic field, then the electron motion is, is quantized into lambda, or in fact it's Rabi levels. So because it's Rabi, we, we calculated this for relativistic uh, uh, Fermi gas. Uh, but okay, so, so the, the, the levels are quantized, and this can also impact uh, the composition. So here is just an example for different magnetic field strengths in, in, this, uh, in, in these units. So uh, if you increase the magnetic field, then you, 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 you can change the sequence, uh, the sequence of nuclei. And then, for instance, here you have uh, a new nuclei which may appear uh, here, or some nuclei which may, uh, which may disappear, like, uh, like here. So uh, if you put a magnetic field, so something one should keep in mind. Magnetars may not have necessarily the same composition as um, uh, as ordinary neutron star. So the composition changes only because the electron fraction changes. Changes because the electron, um, uh, the equation of set of the electron gas changes. Yeah. So for a strong enough magnetic field, one can also uh, change the masses of the nuclei. But for that, you need a much stronger uh, magnetic field, stronger than what was considered here. So also this changes the equation of state. So essentially at low density, so you have a finite density at the surface. Uh, and this, uh, this is uh, well approximated by this kind of formula. And something which is uh, also interesting that the matter tends to be more symmetric. So if you increase the magnetic field, then the matter is less neutron rich uh, in ordinary neutron star. And this can be uh, understood with this kind of simple formula. So which depends on the magnetic field strength and also, uh, obviously, on the symmetry energy. So if you increase B, then you make uh, electron fraction or Z over A um, uh, closer to uh, the symmetry. Is B not in this expression? Is the parameter? 
Yeah, it's just a parameter which can be expressed in terms of uh, B naught and uh, fundamental constants. So, so how this isn't valid up to saturation density? Well, no, no. Uh, this NS is a oh. surface density. Yeah, sorry. Oh, okay. So it's a, it's a density at the surface of uh, of the star. I just want to make a comment uh, about if you are a large field so that only a few Landau levels are, are occupied by the electrons, mm -hmm. then you could also change the crystal structure. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so here we assume, but um, it's well, it seems unlikely because. Uh, um, uh, the, the, the energy associated with uh, the magnetic field. Uh, well, uh, the only way to change the structure is essentially through, uh, let's say, quantum motion of ions due to the magnetic field. And generally, so unless you, are, you have some polarization somewhere. Yeah, uh, no, uh, the magnetic field effects on if the there is no changes the ionic structure. If there, yeah, if you have some kind of polarization in, in the nuclei. Uh, but most nuclei, they, they are not polarized, so I don't know. Yeah, this is something which needs to be, uh, to be studied. Also something funny that actually, when you increase the magnetic field, then you also increase uh, the uh, neutron drip density and the neutron drip pressure. So you're pushing the, the, the drip transition um, at higher pressures and densities. And for a strong enough magnetic field, there is a simple relation. It uh, varies essentially linearly. So the yeah. So you need to have very strong magnetic field. Now the question is, you know, do you have this kind of magnetic field? I know. So for mag, I mean, I'm talking. We are talking about magnetars. So if you believe uh, MHD simulations for by Rose Pons, for instance, they find magnetic field ten to the sixteen, ten to the seventeen Gauss. So this is in the range that is actually shown here. So. Well, you should discuss with Jose Ponce. So I don't know exactly what he puts in this simulation. <laughs> it's no, but it's 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 uh, it's only concentrated in the crust. It's not in the whole star. So it's. Well, this is what he told me. So but I don't know. <laughs> this is what at least he is. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Why well, it's not that strong? I don't, I don't think. You can structure the magnetic field within a star. It's a very hard problem. Yeah, it's still not solved. So, I consider these as just parametric studies. What do you think? What is the field of this much? Then what is the impact? But Cole's point, and I think this is borne out in Jose's simulations also. The very large fields, if you just take it in the star at birth, they will evolve to smaller fields very rapidly. Yeah. And uh, you know, through a lot of dissipative processes, and maybe even some flaring processes, and so that's that's the model. That's why we don't see it. Yeah. Mm. Right. Okay. So, on a hundred year time scale, I think these are all. I think the, the also also cave eight in, in this analysis is that he's assuming that the properties. I mean, he's not considering the change in the structure and properties right. induced by the magnet. So it's not self consistent. Right. Uh, done. So that's why also, yeah, I think there is still a need for. Yeah, I don't know. Depends how low density you are. Depends on how you trust this simulation. So, well, uh, for the virial theorem, you can go to up to ten to the eighteen in the whole star. So, ten to the seventeen confined in the crust. Um, is it really so crazy? No, we, we need a really clarification of the question. Carlisle, mm -hmm. uh, uh, like maybe GR plus electromagnetism, mm -hmm. strong magnetic field. Mm -hmm. No, no, I'm just saying that if you're just uh, applying the simple VR theorem and the Meudon's group, they agreed with that, you get the maximum field strength is 10 to the 18 Gauss. No, that I understand, but you know, that's and, uh, a global this. number. Yeah, sure, but I mean, that's well, why if you assume... No, no, but if you assume that B is zero, B is zero in the star, it's just, you have, uh, I don't know, 10 to the 17 Gauss just in the crust, is it really so crazy? Or? Yes. Yeah. 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 Ye
You think it's crazy? No. And you have uh, uh, simulations for that? So maybe 10 and 16, mm. maybe 10 15, mm. Okay, so maybe we can discuss later on because yeah. I'm not going to finish my talk. Uh, okay, so uh, now for uh, the inner crust, where there is, uh, in addition to clusters, there is also uh, free neutrons. So the method we are using is, uh, is a semi-classical uh, method. Uh, so we are assuming that uh, we have spherical clusters with parameterized density distributions. Uh, we are adding shell effects perturbatively, and we still assume that uh, there is a, a uniform electron gas. And in fact, this method that has been well tested in, uh, in, uh, in finite nuclei uh, uh, many years ago, and this is a very fast approximation to, uh, to, to our Trifog method. But the advantage is that it's, it's avoid all the, 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 the current pitfalls uh, that people have encountered in, in, in implementing boundary conditions. So. So here are some, uh, some results. Uh, so this shows uh, how the distribution uh, changes as one increases the density, so from the neutron drip region down to the crust. So this is uh, uh, essentially the half of the lattice spacing. Um, and so as, as density increases, uh, one can follow here the, 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 the melting of, of, of the crust, where the matter then becomes uh, homogeneous. Uh, and here uh, is shown. Um, uh, the cross core uh, transition densities and pressure for these uh, for these particular models. Now there is still an open issue here about pastas, which we have not included uh, in our studies. So um, around this region, one expect to uh, to have very funny right, funny wouldn't phases. Your, wouldn't you find an inside out phase if it was more stable? Inside out phase? Yeah, where the density in the inside is smaller than. At the surface. Yes, yeah, we checked. Uh, and it doesn't exist. Uh, we found that there, are the, there might be some layers like this, but it's in the very, s very small density range. So it's, uh, and, and, and if there is one, then the contrast is, is, I mean, is almost flat. So it's hard to say that you are really bubbles. So, so. No, this one are uh, this uh, extended. Thomas, so it's not Thomas Fermi. It's extended to the fourth order. So it's uh, adding. Uh, uh, so you are just a coefficient of the fourth order to get the toughest part of this, right? So it, it's, but th th this is an expansion, so it's not a fit. No, I so understand that, but if you did the expansion, it was a four, six, 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 six. Yes, yes, in the gradients, so essentially it's, it's, a, it's a fourth order in the, in the gradients. Yeah. yeah, but it's still that fourth order does a very good job of fitting, uh, matching. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, well. Actually, we have done recently. Uh, uh, it's not published yet, but we have made a detailed comparison between between uh, HF calculations, such as at low densities, and these calculations. Uh, so this is something we are, we are currently testing. Yeah, sorry. No, it's uh, minimized. So we just fix the density, and then we optimize all parameters. So uh, the composition is determined by just. Uh, yeah, beta equilibrium, so the minimum energy. So in practice, how do you do that? You first fix some fraction in the calculation and change by finding that. Yeah, so we do, well, the, 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 the best way to do that is uh, you first uh, start from the neutron drip density where you know what the nuclei is, so you know what is Z, what is N, and, you know, you, you, iter you do it iteratively, so... If you just uh, you know do a brute force calculations at an arbitrary density, then it may the code may be lost. But if you uh, do the calculations increasing the density step by step, then you can. I mean, the change as you see is not dramatic, so yeah. you can easily you know follow uh, yeah. follow the configurations. Uh, so here is a comparison between the the outer crust and inner crust. Uh, just to test uh, how good is this semi-classical approximation. Uh, again, for three different uh, functionals. Uh, so this is a neutron drip density. This is a proton number and neutron number at uh, the neutron drip. This is energy per nucleon, and this is uh, the pressure. So uh, this is uh, the value found from the uh, outer crust code, and this is values found from the inner crust code. 
And uh, so typically there is a few percent discrepancies. Uh, there is more in a neutron number. And the reason that there is no neutron shell effect. So we include proton shell effect, but not neutron shell effect. Because neutron shell effect, they are negligible. As soon as you have a neutron gas, then it, it's negligible. So, so in fact, these errors are largest at the neutron drip. So you do shell effect Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, pairing, I will show. So, so, so far, it was not included, but we have included this more recently. Uh, I, I will show a picture. So. Uh, and so, and we know we can explain these few percent discrepancies because in the, for the outer crust code, for the calculation of nuclear masses, um, well, obviously, we are, we are, we are doing the, the full HFB, so there is pairing, there is shell effects, and there's also other corrections which are not included in the, in the inner crust. Uh, so it's uh, how looks the energy per nucleon as a function of, uh, of Z for different densities and for different functionals. So uh, this dash curve shows the results for um, a purely semi-classical calculation without any shell effects. And this one is when uh, shell effects are uh, included. And so one can see here that there, is, there are local minima at Z equal 20, 40. Um, there is also one and 50. But look at, I mean, the energy scale here, <coughs> which is extremely tiny. I mean, if you look at here, I mean, it's kV, so, so it's extremely small. So in reality, one expects to have, I mean, uh, just a mixture of all these, I mean, of nuclei around here, here. I mean, the energies are, are, are so small that in reality, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, you will never really get just one, one nucleus. So a question about that. Yeah. What kind of implications does that have for the critical strain? I think the response to that, is, well, it, it depends on actually how the nuclei are arranged. So if it's completely random with defects, then presumably the, the breaking strain will be much lower. But if, if you still, I mean, you can imagine that you have some kind of very complicated structure with a lot of, of uh, different nuclei, but still arranged somehow in a crystalline structure. And this way, uh, maybe the, 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 the breaking strain will not change so much. But is that possible to have a wide range of I don't know. <laughs> it's an open question. So it's. So the application is also kind of temperatures that you achieve. In accredited star, it's uh, ten to the, let's say ten to eight k or something like this. So. So it's uh, tens of kV or something like that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. right. But yeah, then uh, at some point it will freeze out, and you will end up in some of this minima. And so the, the actual structure may be very different from one star to another. It may yeah. change every time it Yes. So just to answer your question, I, you know, I'm just going to say what I think Chuck will say, because I've heard him say this before. He would say that the ions can move around easily in these kind of structures. So even if you have a mixture, they will find the right configuration. Which, is, which would be very crystalline, and so the breaking strain won't change very much. So that basic point being that unlike terrestrial cell solids where you can freeze in a lot of impurities, it's difficult to freeze in impurities in these crystals. But, I mean, an impurity is a different composition. Yeah. So are you saying that essentially what's going to happen is that the system will arrange itself to have large swaths at exactly the same Z, for example? Or you know, small z uh, nuclei will get together to, emit, uh, to mimic a large z nucleus, and then they'll have arranged themselves so that, from a macroscopic point of view, the crystal will still look more or less the same. Hmm. So there was uh, yeah the, your question about pairing. So this is uh, what we've done here. So w when we include pairing, uh, then. You go from the dashed line to the solid line, so it's even worse because then you you I mean, you, you, you don't have um, much uh, of the shell effects are most most of the shell effects are washed out, so it's extremely flat minimum. So you expect to have I mean uh, a wide range of different nuclei. Uh, here here the it's less pronounced, but just because the scale also I mean one should look at the scale here is very small. So uh, now. Uh, with this function, we can actually uh, use them not, not just for the crust, but for the higher densities. And um, 
And so we have made the tables of equation of state, so the, the restriction that we assume that just purely nucleonic, there is no hyperons, nothing else. Um, and so the compositions and everything is, is, uh, is available online. And, and Sasha Potekin made uh, some Fortran subroutines for fitting, uh, for fitting the equation of state, but also the composition. And it's implemented in, in, in the Yofe routines for the conductivities as well. Uh, grid space, uh, I don't remember the exact numbers, but we have several hundreds of, uh, of, of, uh, points. of points. We have many more actually in the, in the autocross, but because we wanted to find the, so we have something like 6,000 points for the autocross because we wanted to find the transition, but we have hundreds of points and it's very easy to just to, to compute. So Yes, yeah. yeah. This is zero temperature? Yes, zero temperature catalyzed matter. Is there and any uh, effort in place to do finite temperature? Yeah, actually we have, we have done calculations with uh, Powell Hansel and the Sheikh Zdunik about accreted crust. So it's still, calculations are done, but we just uh, are, writing, are writing the paper now. So it so will come out. Even higher temperatures relevant for binary neutron star merger mm -hmm. or supernova simulation. Oh, this uh, we still haven't done, so. Yes, so it's much simpler in a sense. Uh, maybe, yeah, it's, it's just a piece of warning for me for astrophysicists because uh, generally, I mean, people like to use polytrop because it, it, it makes life easy, but if you, like at the, uh, if you look at the adiabatic index as a function of density, then, well, one can see that maybe a polytropic approximation may not be so good, so it's just. <laughs> okay. <so. laughs> yeah, but a lot of people who use polytropes only use them in a density range. You know, it's the two top, yeah, two top orders of magnitude. Well, yeah, I mean, even if you focus on the core, then uh, I mean, it's it's going to change. I, I know. I'm just, I'm just saying. Okay. <laughs> okay. <it's laughs> you take a uh, okay. So here is about the what we got for the mass reduced relation, and obviously at low. Uh, at low densities, uh, the, the, the models are the same. And, uh, and so as, as, as you go to more massive neutron star, then you are probing uh, denser regions where uncertainties are larger. And this is so kind of uncertainties uh, in this band, let's say, uh, that corresponds to the, to, to the functional that we, that we consider. Uh, OK, so maybe I will uh, say just a few words about superfluidity because um, Time is running out. Uh, so we also uh, did calculations of, um, of superfluid properties, like for instance, sparing gaps. Uh, so including the effects of, uh, of the nuclear clusters. And essentially, uh, at least for the dense region of the crust, nothing dramatic uh, really happens. So there is, uh, it's uh, quite funny, but we find essentially the same kind of universal relation as uh, uh, in the BCS relation for the critical temperature and for the, the pairing gaps. And essentially, the effect of the cluster is to reduce the gaps found in pure neutron matter by something like about uh, 20%. Uh, something also that uh, may be uh, uh, useful for astrophysicists is uh, this picture showing uh, the pairing, uh, pairing field as a function of, of, uh, of distance uh, from the from, from the lattice from a given lattice site, and this curve shows the pairing gap you would have calculated if you assume that the matter is locally homogeneous. So matter locally homogeneous, you just take numbers from uh, many body calculation, and this is what you found. Now, if you do the the, the, the calculations, including uh, the coupling of uh, of, uh, of neutrons that are bound and unbound, this is what you found. So um, the the change in the pairing gaps are much less dramatic. And, uh, and the reason is that the current lens is, is can be very large, much larger than the nuclear clusters. And so the, the physical picture is that, is that actually superfluid, uh, it's not like superfluid flowing past nuclei like obstacles. The superfluid is everywhere. So it's, uh, uh, you have superfluids outside clusters, but also inside clusters. So, so the, the, uh, and this distinction can be important, for instance, for calculating pinning or stuff like that, because actually people have made simple estimates uh, distinguishing the two, but okay. So the yes. the mm -hmm. which have their own pairing properties, mm -hmm. and also they have different ones that they don't have pairing properties. Mm -hmm. How would they smooth each other? Would they smooth each other? 
Yeah, they are, mo they are smoothing in this way. So, so when you when you account for uh, both bound neutrons and unbound neutrons at the same footing, then uh, the pairing uh, that you get is some kind of average uh, pairing, if you wish, uh, which is given by this. So it's uh, it's a smoothing out the the contrast in the pairing inside and outside clusters. So it reduces the gaps uh, outside because you go from here to here. It's about 20%. Or, but you, uh, you increase also strongly the gaps inside from outside. By a lot. Yeah, by a lot factor here. So that's why if you are doing calculations of pinning forces and you are using just this simple local density approximation, you might be quite wrong. So. Now, something which, uh, which was found... Uh, so qualitatively, does it mean they're less pinned? Yes, yeah, yeah. Something which was found by the Orsay group uh, two years ago, it's, uh, it's a funny uh, behavior close to the neutron drip transition. So it, this shows the pairing gaps as a function of temperature. And uh, so for different uh, compositions, and so if you take, for example, this one, this is a usual BCS behavior. You increase the temperature, then your pair gap goes to zero. But now, depending on the composition, if you increase the number of neutrons, then you can have some kind of funny phases where when you are he heating the system, then you, you are killing the superfluidity. But at some points, the, superfluidi uh, the superfluidity re-enters. And the reason that when you are heating the system, then you can excite bound neutrons in the continuum, which can form pairs and, uh, and become superfluid. So, and this happens only in the region close to neutron drip. So uh, in this region, my, one may have some, some kind of this funny, funny behavior. So I don't know for, for if this is something important for the cooling or not, but this is funny anyway. And I, I did calculations uh, uh, to try to see if I find uh, also this behavior. and. Uh, the preliminary results suggest that there's also this kind of behavior where pairing gaps goes to zero and then it increases uh, at higher temperatures. Okay, so maybe I will maybe I will end up here because I don't have time. I don't want to exhaust everybody. So I will go directly to the conclusions. Uh, so here is the take-home message. Uh, uh, the message is that. Well, y you might think that the crust is some, some, something which is very simple because, well, afterwards it's just made of neutrons, protons, electrons, uh, and the density is very low. I mean, so we don't have quarks or hyperons. So in, in principle, it is something very simple, except that uh, the, the physics of this system is extremely rich. So we have lots of different phases, superfluidity and so on, crystallization, and uh, there are still many issues that needs to be, uh, to be understood. So just a few, I mean, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a very few uh, issues uh, that still need to be, uh, to be understood. So, uh, I mean, the question of impurities and how does it affect the, the crustal properties, the question of pastas, which I haven't discussed at all. Um, the fact that accreted crust and also magnetar may have completely different, uh, different uh, crustal properties. And uh, superfluidity also is, is, is still not well, uh, not well understood, especially the dynamics of this superfluid is not well understood. And uh, collective excitations, uh, which involve the superfluid and, uh, and uh, vibrations of the crystal lattice, but if they are pasta, then you can also have uh, vibrations of the pasta. So everything can be, in principle, coupled, and you may have quite complicated spectrum, which can affect also all your uh, transport uh, transport properties and, and the cooling. So there are still many things that that's needs to be uh, to be understood. And uh, I just I mean sketch a very few of these issues in in, in the short time had. So thank you for your attention. Yeah, it, it was maybe not that extreme distribution, I think. What he's done is he's done simulations in which he's put some impurity of one time, you know, in the lattice, yeah. and asked, did it change the breaking strength? And he you know, surprisingly found that it did not change the breaking strength. 
So he'll like have two different types of nuclei or something? Yes, I think he had two different types of nuclei, or he had a, um, a region where there was no composition change, but he just artificially changed the location of all the latter sites so that it looked like uh, a defect. So I've seen those, and <coughs> it is impressive how much those smooth out, but you're finding a factor of two uh, spread in Z, mm -hmm. is very comparable finding it in nuclei. Mm -hmm. That's a lot. Yeah, yeah, that's a lot, yeah. yeah. So I mean, this is still something which needs to be uh, to be understood too. So the message here is just to you know be careful with this you know pure composition. Maybe reality might be much more complicated than that. But so. Well-defined problem, right? You can always physically and mathematically find a certain distribution which is for integer and Yes. Yeah, 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 exactly. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. No, this is something we, we can do, yeah. 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 So, uh, does, does it change in composition affect the uh, shear model? Uh, yes, it can change the shear models, yes, yeah. But uh, by a lot, or, I mean, do you have some, some idea? Uh, well, it can change a lot if you think, if you, if you look at uh, at this local minima I had. So uh, there's typica typically minima, well, it might be model dependent, but at least in the model we are, we are using, then you have typically minima at z equal, uh, let's say, 20, and uh, see, so 20, 40, and in some region you have also the local minima at z equal 50. So, I mean, it's, it's a huge change in z. So, shear modulus, I don't remember the scaling in z, uh, it's z to some power. Uh, so I don't know if you can get a factor of two, okay. but... Uh, so if I may comment on that in particular, it, for example, if you're thinking about magnetic PPO yeah. for the lower, yeah. for, the, for the fundamental mode, the, the shear modulus the, at the, exactly these densities the, where the cross core transition happens is the most relevant to that particular frequency. And so, um, of course, there's a z-dependence, but also the presence of phosphor would be maybe important to know how that, how that the mm. transition happens. Yeah, sure, yeah. Yeah, so not just the composition, but also, yeah, the if you have pasta, then not just this relevant, but the actual shapes of these things, so, yeah, you can change a lot, so. Uh, you said that this, this composition could change from star to star, or it's not fixed yet by the Well, it could change simply because, I mean, it maybe it's not <coughs> universal. No, it's, it's, probably, it's, it's, it's probably not because uh, I mean the differences are so small that depending on how the star will cool and how the star will, uh, you know, uh, what would be the seed for the crystallization, then you may end up uh, here, you may end up here, or you may end up here, or even very far away because the energies are so small. It's something like KeV, so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, I mean it's a very small temperature, a very small energy, so... Uh, so when the, um, depending on you know, what was the initial composition in in, in the progenitor, or you, know, you you may you may end up in completely different. Uh, so so in in a sense this is depressing because then it depends on the peculiar star you are studying, right? So, but it's. So I think the, the the main message is that I mean uh, don't take for granted this uh, cold catalyzed matter hypothesis. Maybe one should question that and look into more details about how the star cools and uh, and follow the the, the the actual cooling of uh, I mean the, the the formation of the crust, the, all these reactions. Yeah. Maybe one should follow that more closely. Yeah, we haven't appreciated that. Yeah. Well, actually, for the crust, I mean for the yeah. for the crust, a yeah. different yeah. story. But for the crust, it's. So so if you did a WKB approximation and looked at this, the barrier height, the penetration through the barrier, what would be the time scale of going from one unit to the next? Uh, yeah, time scale, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah, yeah. Something one could do. Yeah. 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 Another question. So I think, you know, with respect to if there are these minima that are so far apart, 20 and 40, and then you know, this dependence on previous history for the shear modulus becomes very interesting. But I guess in magnetars, they are hot for a while. Mm. And the pycnonuclear fusion of two Z20s on the time scale of you know, high during the early high temperature phase of the magnetar, just a wide guess, <laughs> I think will be short. 
Hmm. So even though you have these two that are far separated, uh, I think temperature effects will just smear out the population around the deeper minimum. And you'll get some spread, uh, but you know, again, speculation at the time. Well, I mean, uh, as I pointed out in the discussion yesterday, the magnetars are, even now, are unusually hot. And you know, the argument is that they have mag uh, heating in the, in the crust. Right. And mm -hmm. so, so at some point, you know, they spend mm -hmm. a lot of time at 10 to the 9 Kelvin. Yeah. And at 10 to the 9 Kelvin, you, mm -hmm. know, you have enough time to well, move the population mm -hmm. around. Well, I mean, even at the present time, they're not at 10 to 9, but they're, you know, up there. <laughs> in terms of the but then if you are in 10 to 9, I mean, look at the scale. I mean, 10 to 9, 0.1 yeah. MeV. So you will, I mean, you will have, I mean, a whole, a very wide distribution of, of nuclei. Right. So yeah, but, uh, you know, you'd still mm -hmm. have an it's excess I mean, at ZFR, right? Well, but okay. look at the difference. It's something like with a few kV, so per nucleon, so it's extremely it's small. Yeah. So... I mean, 10 to 8 Kelvin. Yeah, so if you have 10 to the 9 K, it's uh, I mean 100 of KV, then uh, you know, yeah. everything is washed out. Uh, so we have a, a very wide distribution of, of, uh, of different <coughs> Z. Well, yeah, I don't know, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 that's a good question. Uh, because, well, the temperature depends also on the composition, right? So it's <laughs> if you have a mixture of so different nuclei, can it still be uh, solid? Uh, yeah. So this goes back to the Jones argument that, you know, this maybe yeah, this, yeah, is that's right. this is all amorphous and uh, yeah, yeah. you just have a... Yeah. But there are these observations, uh, quasi-persistence of cigarette changes where could if care fitting seems to exclude an amorphous crust, uh, so. Yeah, so that's for a colder uh, uh, object, right? I mean, mm, why, well, it's a bit colder, yeah, but not 10 to 8, you know, so yeah. it's right. still. So what, what about the observations It's for this uh, quasi presence of secret changes, this bunch of uh, objects which have been uh, monitored. The thermal relaxation of uh, accreting stars, okay. which have been accreted for yeah, some years. Yeah, that's true, yeah, that's true, yeah, so. Maybe not. <laughs> Maybe not, but okay, so it's, uh, people who have made these simulations, like Ed Brown and others, they found that if you, uh, if you have a completely amorphous crust, then you are completely off. Uh, so, well, uh, but right maybe there is some something else missing, or. Uh, well, for example, Andrew Tunney has pointed out that, you know, there's some mysterious energy source that you think Yeah, that's true, yeah, that's right, yeah. Yeah. Given those sorts of uncertainties. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. yeah so I think there are, there are basically two paradigms to understand thermal relaxation of the crust. Either there is a very unique accretion disk dynamics that somehow is more or less the same in very different objects, or thermal relaxation is really thermal conduction in the crust. So yes, there may be mysterious things about heat sources in different places, but we don't have any other explanation for the time scale. So I would say unless we have a model that can predict the time scale like the crust relaxation model can, there may be small tweaks one has to do with the crust relaxation model to make it more realistic and explain all of the data. Um, and until one develops an alternate model, uh, you know, I'm inclined to think that the you know, thermal relaxation model of the crust is better tested than almost any other phenomena in the crust structure. Because you have several sources, and you see this multiple, in multiple sources. There are a lot of phenomena in neutron stars. But, but OK, so, so essentially what you're saying is you need a very high thermal conductivity. Mm -hmm. If you had an amorphous mm -hmm. composition, then this would shut it off. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, no. if somebody comes up and says, oh, yeah, I, my accretion disk model gives you exactly the same time scale, then I would stop worrying. Until then, mm -hmm. you know, I think this is a natural mm -hmm. explanation. Is it a high thermal conductivity that is needed? Uh, something that could be established through theory? No, I mean, that's, that's what we're debating. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. It looks like theory says it could be amorphous, it could be mm -hmm. uh, crystalline, and the data wants it to be crystalline. Well, but actually, a question of that. These are, these are quite deep, I thought, compared to the relevant uh, depths for the relaxation of these transit sources. I mean, this is a third of nuclear saturation depth. Mm -hmm. So it, it isn't it the case that when you have these transiently accreting sources, it's not mm -hmm. that far down that you care about, is it? You do. 
because it's shape of mm. the, the, oh, the well. CO sensitive, the heat conductor in you may not cost. Well, so mm. what happens to heat at these mm. vessels is, is I mean, mm. uh, it just goes inwards. It goes yeah. inwards. Yeah. So the rate at which it goes inwards sets up the time scale that you observe. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so yeah, that might be the solution of this thing because uh, if, if, if you assume that only the low density region contribute, then uh, then you have, I mean, the 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 the, the barrier here is, is higher in energies. It's uh, something like several hundred kV. So, so in the thermal relaxation model. So if you are probing so just the time probes low density, yeah. late time probes high density. So it's actually some kind of tomography. You're know, basically looking into. Yeah. The you're looking at the thermal conductivity as a function of depth as you look at the light curve as a function of time. And you get down to these densities within what amount of time? Like a few years? Um, hmm. yeah. Not a few years. Um, well, I think these are 100 day time scales. Thank you.